Hello! So in the last video, we made a basic quiz buzzer system. Now I don't want to be tripping over all these wires or untangling them when I get them out of the box, so in this video, we're going to upgrade them and make them wireless. So, I'm going to use one of these NRF24 devices. They can be a bit of a pain to get working, but once set up, they're fantastic. They also make this larger version, with a longer range too. I can use it with this small little adapter board, which helps provide a more stable 3.3 volt power supply, which helps a lot with reliability. These devices can also transmit or receive, but not both at the same time. You can, however, transmit some data and automatically receive an acknowledgement payload from the other side. More on this later. To make the buttons truly wireless, we're going to need to run them from battery. So I'm gonna use one of these lithium charge modules. They can also supply a power supply while the battery is charging, which is great in case you forget to plug them in. You can also control the exact voltage output too. Paired with a suitable battery like this, and put into a suitable container, because you shouldn't be soldering onto the contacts of these, that completes the power requirements. Each button will use an Arduino Pro Mini, seeing as the code is once set, we don't need to change it or access it again. And we'll connect everything up like this. And here's a short high-speed montage of me assembling the red button. version, I've slightly redesigned the base for these to incorporate the charge controller, and where the cable was before, I've added a power button. We could optionally put the Arduino and the radio into low power when not in use, but I'll leave that up to you. You could also optionally build this up on Vero or Perf board, or just use DuPont wires when connecting this up. So, onto the controller. We're going to use an Arduino Nano for future proofing, as we might want to link this to controller to a computer in the future to build some sort of interactive quiz or something. You could potentially use a Pro Mini if you don't want to do all that, and if so, you'll wire up the power like in the first diagram. The Nano, however, is wired like this. It's got some of the same connections as the buttons, but this version also has the DF Player Mini, 5 LEDs and 2 buttons. Ready for high speed assembly?
The code for this is a little bit more intelligent. Once someone answers, it will block out all of the others. However, if you press the ready button again, it will only allow button presses from anyone who hasn't answered yet until you press reset. Looks neat, doesn't it? Now, before going any further, let's lay down some rules regarding these NFR24 devices. Firstly, there's a lot of clones, so make sure you source them all from the same supplier at the same time. This is very important. The device can be set up on 125 radio channels. Within that, you can open up to six data pipes, and there's some rules about how you address them. The entire device can only be either transmitting or receiving, but not both at the same time. However, you can change this anytime you want. You can also queue up three different acknowledgement messages at a time that are sent back when a message is received. These ACK messages are what most people struggle with. They aren't a write and forget, they're consumed each time one is sent. This is where the six data pipes become a pain, because you'd need to queue one up for each pipe before sending it. But you can only queue up three in total, not per pipe. Turns out though, the pipes really aren't that useful. If you want to separate the signals, it's best to add an ID into your data somewhere and just use the pipe name to separate this network from another. The rule here is, queue one ACK payload, and then each time you read a message, queue another one. This way, there'll always be one available for the next message. If two devices transmit at the same time, the data will become garbled and ignored. We'll detect this because the write function will fail, or we won't get an ACK message back. But if we allow both then to retransmit at the same time, they'll clash again. So instead, we'll steal an idea from Ethernet. With Ethernet, if there's a collision, each transmitter backs up and waits for a random amount of time. If they clash again, the random amount of time gets larger and so on until successful. Surprisingly, this works very well. So here's the plan. We'll set up the main controller as a listener and the buttons as transmitters. We'll keep the buttons continuously sending messages, which will include if the button is pressed or not. And in the response back, we'll reply with information about what the button should be doing. For example, if the button works, or if the LED should be flashing or on or off. Now with the hardware out of the way, let's start with the code for the buttons. First, we'll start by including the RF24 library, and then creating the class to use it. We'll also define the pins used for the button and the LED. We'll want this button to remember which one it is, so we'll read that from the EEPROM. In the setup function, we'll configure the two pins for the button and the LED. And then if a button number hasn't been assigned yet, we'll wait until the number 1 to 4 is sent over the serial port. This is then written to the EEPROM for next time. Next, we initialise the radio device, and configure all its various properties. Then we configure the communication data pipes. As these radio devices can work on 125 different frequencies, we create a little routine that will search all the channels looking for the controller. Next, we make a function to handle our communication. This will write a single byte to the other end, and will consist of a button number, and if the button's pressed or not. The NRF24 device will automatically perform retries on its own, but we've got our special retry algorithm here that is much like the Ethernet protocol. We attempt to write the message, and if it fails, we wait a random amount of time. If successful, we see if an acknowledgement payload has been returned to us. If there is, we check it's the size we're expecting. There's four bytes in this payload, one for each of the buttons. And from that data, we extract if the button should be enabled and the status of the LED. Now onto the main loop. If the button's enabled and is pressed down, we send this information to the other end. If it's not pressed and it's been over 150 milliseconds since our last communication, we send a status message. Finally, we control the state of the LED based on what we've been told to do. This code's also been designed just to blink the LED momentarily if there's no communication with the controller. It's not that complex. The state of the buttons is controlled by the acknowledgement messages sent back from the controller. So let's have a look at the controller's code. Like the button, with the controller, the first thing we do is sort out the radio communication. Next, like the wired version, we configure the software serial library so that we can use it for the audio device. The controller has a status LED for each of the buttons, so we set up a pin for each of those buttons, and then declare a set of variables to monitor the state of each of the buttons. As we said before, this device can operate on 125 different channels, so this bit of code looks at some of the channels and tries to find one of the quiet ones. In the setup function, the first thing we do is initialise the audio. Then we configure the radio device, configure our status LED, our reset and our ready buttons, configure our data pipes, and start listening for data. The last thing we do is populate our first ACK payload. This function updates a 4 byte array. Each of the bytes represents one of the button's statuses, which includes the status of the LED, and whether the button is actually enabled. In the main loop, if the reset button is held down, we go through all the buttons, turn them all off, and stop any sounds that are playing. 
as well as turning off our status LED. If the ready button is pressed, we'll make buttons flash that haven't previously answered and we'll stop any audio that's playing, as well as setting our status LED to on. Now comes to monitoring these buttons. If they're connected, but we haven't seen them for over a second, we'll mark them as no longer connected. This will cause them to continuously blink every now and then. Then we update the status of our LED to match what the button would be showing. Finally, we actually start looking for messages received from the buttons. If there's data available, we read one byte from it. And from that, we extract the button number. We then update its last contact time and mark that it was in contact. Now, if the button was pressed, it's enabled, hasn't answered yet, and we're in a ready state, then we turn off our ready state, play the sound effect for that button, note that it's answered, and then set the button that answered to be the only one that's lit up. And finally, because we've received some data, we know we've sent an ACK message back, so we'll set up another one for the next message. So after programming both systems, we'll try it out. I've connected the controller to my camera for this, so you can hear the audio output too. So firstly, we'll power the controller on. And you can see once started, the four LEDs are blinking to indicate there's no communication with the buttons. Now I'll turn the controller off and turn the buttons on. And you can see the buttons are intermittently blinking as well to also indicate no communication with the controller. Then I'll switch the controller back on and after a few seconds you can see that all the buttons have stopped flashing. The green button is ready so we'll press that, ready meaning ready for an answer. And immediately the moment I press it all four buttons start blinking away and I answer with the red button and note that all the others stop flashing and the red button stays lit. At this point we have two options. I could press the green button to allow other people to guess, or I could press the yellow button and reset the system. We'll press the green to continue the demonstration. Immediately the other three buttons start flashing and I'll press the green one. And I'll continue this sequence working my way through until there's no buttons available. Note how the controller is showing exactly what's going on on the buttons. Lastly I'll press the yellow button to reset the system. Now when I press the green button they all start blinking again. Wow, so that works great! You might want to consider adding a Bluetooth audio module in the future to make this truly wireless. In the code I've set this to transmit on the lowest possible power, but you could increase that, and if you need a greater distance then you can use this version of the radio module which has an amplifier for increased range. If you wanted to make an interactive quiz system in the future, you could also modify the code to send the button data over the serial port and build an application on your PC or Raspberry Pi to show the questions, or perhaps some other game. I'll build something like this in a future video. Don't want to miss it? Well, you know what to do. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.